and welcome to Irish Pregnancy and Birth with me, Carolyn Coughlin. I'm a self-employed community midwife working in the Dublin Midlinster area. The mission of this podcast is to empower pregnant women with the most up-to-date information on all things pregnancy and birth by interviewing maternity healthcare professionals on a different topic every episode. For our second episode, we're incredibly lucky to have with us Dr. Deirdre Daly. Deirdre is an assistant professor at Trinity College Dublin. She has over 35 years clinical and educational experience in midwifery, teaches and supervises across undergraduate and postgraduate programs, and leads the MAMI study research team, which is a massive project with 3,000 participants signed up to date. This is just a sample of Deirdre's long list of achievements, which are too numerous to mention. Today we'll be talking about maternal health um, and well-being, postnatal incontinence and sex after childbirth. Deirdre, you're very welcome to the show. Oh, and thanks for inviting me, Carolyn. So, as I mentioned, you lead the team on the MAMI study. It's an incredible project. Can you tell the listeners about some of its aims and findings so far? Okay, well, first of all, MAMI stands for Maternal Health and Maternal Morbidity in Ireland. It's a longitudinal study carried out over time, looking at the health of, we started with first-time mothers, and looking at their health 12 months before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and then at different time points, three, six, nine, and 12 months after the birth. So we started the study in one hospital in Ireland in 2012, and then extended to a second site, 2013, and a third site in 2015, and recruited women from the three different sites over time. And it really started with looking at exploring the health and the health problems that women might experience, such as urinary incontinence, mental health issues, including anxiety and depression, sexual health issues, pain, with pain anywhere in the body, but also pelvic girdle pain and back pain. And we also included a section on intimate partner violence, that's domestic violence. And I suppose one of the reasons, Carla, we started was Ireland doesn't have any data available on women's health after the birth. Now, that's no different than a lot of other countries. But what it means really is that we have no way of knowing if women are or stay healthy or they develop problems and if those problems persist over time. So that was the whole purpose to really look at the extent existence and severity of women's health problems right about the time they give birth to their first baby and we've now since moved on to both the second baby and five-year follow-up of those women. It's very interesting Deirdre. So um, we had uh, Professor Cecily Begley on the show and she spoke about Trinity's free online antenatal course which is called Journey to Birth. Mm-hmm. Um, you have also led a, the creation of a free online course um, for mothers, and it's called um, WAM. Uh, wow. Can you tell? <laughs> can you tell us more about it? WAM W H A M stands for Women's Health After Motherhood, and WAM was developed in 2000, just last year, 2019, and launched for the first time in October. So I'll tell you how it started. When we were doing the MAMI study, and I mean all of the team, not just myself, but we all believe these, this information is from women. And one of the things we started doing in 2015, 16, was sharing the findings back with them. So telling them what they told us and telling them about the number of women who were in excellent health and the number of women who were experiencing problems and the problems at the different times. And I suppose maybe if I mention the problems first of all, so that we find out that before pregnancy, for example, one in about three women were leaking some amount of urine. During pregnancy, that went up to almost two in five women. But what we found then was that they were leaking more frequently and leaking a greater amount of urine. After the birth at three months, over one in two women were leaking urine. And even at 12 months afterwards, around about two in five women were leaking some amount of urine. We found similar um, proportions of women who were experiencing um, sexual health issues, pain, depression, anxiety, stuff like that. Um, In 2016, yes, 15, 16, we shared the findings of the women and very much what they said was, you can't just present those 
stats, you have to do something. So 1718, we got more funding from the Health Service Executive to set up what we called a PPI, Public Participation Initiative in Research. So a group of women in the MAMI study, all there was almost 90 of them join us, either in person or online, um, to work with us towards developing other research on what really matters to women. And again, the same common theme was coming from women. You have to do something. So we applied for more money from European Institutions Innovation Technology Health, and we're very fortunate to get funding for WAM. And WAM, as I said, is Women's Health After Motherhood. It's an online course based on what women said they wished they had known. And the course and the content was all developed and co-created with the women. So it was very much about sharing with women what women told us they wish they had known, sharing the findings from all of the various stats. Not everything, but most of them, certainly the ones that were coming up more frequently. And as I said, we developed it online and it's developed as about a four hour, so over four week content. And it really looks at, week one looks at maternal health and myths, returning to exercise. Your week two really focuses on urinary incontinence, some information about fecal incontinence, and then how to do your pelvic floor exercises. Week three looks at mental health, particularly focused on anxiety. And week four looks at relationships, sexual, intimate, and domestic violence. And the whole package was put together, as I said, with the women. Again, based on what they told us they wished they had known. So it was about creating a, an online resource for women um, about their health after motherhood. Because I think, and it was developed, it was women said you have to do something, but they also told us that they really struggled to find reliable, trustworthy information. And oftentimes they'd be searching the internet and there was no shortage of information, but it's often really hard to know what to trust and what's right and not right. So that was the start of WAM. It was, I would have to say, inspired by the women. Fantastic. That's great. And it was the woman who initiated all this. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, yes. So you collaborated with the University of Barcelona and a university in the Netherlands. Um, what is the experience, uh, the maternity experience for women there as compared to here? Oh, well, of course, I should have said that the course is available in English, thank you, and also available in Spanish and now Dutch. And uh, we're also hoping to collaborate with others to develop it in other languages, which is great. So what's their experience? Very different, very different in some ways in terms of how their maternity services are organised, how maternity care is delivered, who delivers it and where. So, for example, we know from the Netherlands that it was one of the countries that was always coming up first about the number of women who birth at home. And over the years that the proportion of women who give birth at home has been declining, but there's still considerable numbers there. Spain, very different depending on what region of Spain you are. And there's some regions, particularly the one that we were collaborating with, which was Catalonia, have developed, have a really strong um, drive towards re reshaping maternity services, introducing birth centres, very different. But one of the really common things was that there are no data on women's health after motherhood. And it's the same issues. And you see it not just from those two countries, but from all over the world. If you read the literature on women's health after birth, it's the same things that are coming up again and again. The numbers that of women who are experiencing these health problems. And their health problems and issues that they're never going to, well, they're not, not never, but they're not the sort of issues that are going to threaten a woman's life, but they're the sort of issues that can leave women miserable. Mm. And one of the things, as I said, in all of that body of international literature, one of the most startling findings is the recurrent nature of all of these issues. Again and again, they're coming up. And oftentimes there's 
a lack of publicly available data, so they're not captured routinely. Okay, so there's common themes across the countries, really. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, maternity services are structured in different ways. I mean, some countries have, you know, very, very different follow-up systems whereby they have people going into the woman's home for longer times afterwards. But it might be different types of people, you know, different care assistants or someone else like they do in some places in the Netherlands. Or the focus might be different. One of the things, again, that comes up in a lot of the international literature, and it's now came up very strongly in the MAMI study, is that whole postpartum period. Care seems to shift and does shift from the woman's health to the baby's. So women will say that their own health is neglected. And oftentimes in the busyness of motherhood, women would say that they do neglect their own health. And it really takes three to six months at least for women to begin to think to, to feel confident in mothering and to feel that they start thinking about their own health yeah okay so is there anything that they get right over in the other countries um say that they're doing that the midwives are doing there that we can do better to support women here is there anything like that we as healthcare professionals can do better that we can take from there i mean it, again i would say one of the things that you see from talking to a lot of colleagues and from even again reading the literature is if you look at what women who experience a really positive childbirth experience say it's that they felt really listened to and you'll get excellent examples of that in ireland and you get excellent examples of it dotted around the place and in other countries but you'll also get those women who don't have that really positive experience. And I think from looking at the literature, it's about putting the woman first, listening to her. And again, I think it's having services afterwards that are, they don't stop after the birth, but they go on. And even, you know, in our strategy in Ireland and the women in the MAMI study, women are saying stopping maternity care, for example, at six weeks postpartum, far, far too soon. Women haven't even, particularly first time mothers, haven't even started thinking about their own health at that stage. So I think, number one, definitely listen to the woman and really hear what she's saying. And then afterwards, it's have postpartum, it's having services that go on and that are woman focused and help her begin to look and at and address her own health issues. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, so one of the issues covered in WAM uh, is mental health and anxiety. Uh, these supports are more and more being seen as not just for women with diagnosed conditions, but for all women as part of a wellness program. How best can we uh, we support women's mental health during pregnancy and in the postnatal period? One of the things that we found in the MAMI study, Carlin, was that considerable proportions of women came to their first pregnancy with mental health issues, both anxiety and depression. So I think one of the first things we can do as maternity care professionals in that first meeting with the woman is begin to open up the conversation about mental health issues. And mental health issues are much more, there's a broad spectrum of them, and they're much more than, you know, having a diagnosis of depression or another mental illness. It's much more than that. It's about your well-being, it's about anxiety, as I said, and it's about depression. And we found that as many as I think is about one in 14 women experienced some degree of even anxiety before their first pregnancy. That declined a little bit during pregnancy, but three months after the birth, round about one in eight women were experiencing anxiety and about one in eight women experiencing depression. And even 12 months later, there were still considerable proportions of women experiencing both anxiety and depression. So I think what can we do with the services? The first thing is raise the conversation. And the other thing that we've tried to do in the Women's Health After Motherhood videos by particularly my colleague Agnes Higgins, Professor of Mental Health in Trinity College, was 
provide women with the information on how you recognize when a mental health issue has become a mental health problem. So for example, people talk about anxiety. Anxiety is a normal reaction, it's a normal response to a new threatening situation. And what we've tried to do and Agnes has tried to do is enable women to understand when that anxiety becomes a real problem and how to recognize that. Mm -hmm. So for example, for a lot of women, you know, and for a lot of us, if you're doing a presentation or if you feel you or someone belonging to you is threatened, you know, anxiety will be a normal response. But if it's interfering with your everyday wellness, everyday activity, your relationships, if it's stopping you from enjoying just being with yourself and being a new mom, then it's perhaps time to begin to talk to someone else, a trusted friend to start with or someone, or seek help. Mm -hmm. Within the maternity services, and I think again, the first thing is to raise the conversation. And I would also say that it's not, it's not about raising the conversation just once, it's about asking again and again, because things can, it can take women a while to disclose something. It can take them a while to feel comfortable talking to us when they come to the services. In Ireland, I think we're our perinatal mental health services, that's the services that are designed for women. They're getting better and they're getting more organized in the different regions. So that most institutions now would have a service either well established or become building up to help support women. And they often, more often than not now, will have a mental health or some practitioner in place to help women and um, to have so that women have some place to go. But I think the first thing, that first element of how you help is ask and to ask in a really non-judgmental supportive way so that it is how are you how are you feeling and if you are having a problem how can I help and what role can the partners and family play in supporting mothers experiencing these issues I think Again, in, in, in terms of what role can the partner play, I mean, the woman herself, I think, within her relationship will or will not feel comfortable talking to partners or trusted friends. But I think if you look at motherhood, particularly first time motherhood, it's a major life changing event. And I think that partners, families, they need to I think be open, be discussive, be able to share and say, how are you feeling? And I think for the women to be able to have the conversation with a partner that says, I don't feel okay. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that coping. So that is, I'd say, the biggest, I think, and probably most important thing someone to do is be there, be listening, be non-judgmental. And to bottom line is, how can I help? Okay, um, a figure coming out of the MAMI study that shocked me was that uh, one in two women experience incontinence problems after giving birth, not just in the weeks afterwards, but as an ongoing chronic issue. This seems to be something that is not spoken about enough. Uh, what would you recommend women to do to lessen their chances of developing maternal incontinence? Okay, one of the things I think, first of all, is that we, we use language that, you know, even the word incontinence and people think of much older, older people. And I mean, women would have said that to me in interviews I did with them. And they think that incontinence is, you know, losing the contents of your bladder. Incontinence, the actual definition is leaking urine from your bladder when you don't need to. And for some women, it can be drops. And can, for some, it can be emptying the whole contents of your bladder. So I think, first of all, that we have to, yes, talk about incontinence, but describe it as leaking urine when you don't mean to. What can we do about it? I think very early on, I said that one in three women leaked some degree of urine before their first pregnancy. 
So it's not just a pregnancy, it's not an issue that develops in pregnancy or afterwards. And that might have been a belief for a lot of people a while ago, and even still. But we know that it pre-exists pregnancy. And we know that from the women in the MAMI study that about one in 12 of those women leak urine once a month or more frequently. So that's quite often, but quite frequent. Um, do we talk about it? No. Are women asked about it during pregnancy? I would imagine in most places they're not. Um, and I think in terms of society, there's a language around it in that, you know, it's often dismissed or laughed about it. I laughed so much I leaked, I nearly wet myself. So there's almost like a subtle acceptance of it. And I think that that's the first thing we have to say is leaking urine is common, but it's not normal and it can be treated. And you go back to mention the figure three months postpartum, one in two women leak urine. Yeah, that's a huge staggering figure. And what's also staggering, I think, is that two in five still leak urine monthly or more frequently, 12 months after the birth, which is very high. And people might say, well, it's not too bad. It's not going to threaten your life or anything. Well, it can make women miserable, and it does. And it makes them change the type of exercise they do. It makes some women stop exercising completely. So it is a life-altering condition that can control women and their lives. So one of the things that women can do is pelvic floor muscle exercises. And they're the first line conservative treatment to treat and to help women regain control over their bladder. And when should women do the exercises? Well, we should be doing them all our lives. So it becomes not just a maternal health issue, it becomes a women's health issue. It's a men's health issue as well. But we should be doing it as part of, you know, adolescent health. Yeah. Okay, so you don't, do you think it's a modern problem or have women always experienced this to such a degree or is it, is it just simply taboo, you know, like you mentioned there that people make light of it or maybe people feel uncomfortable talking about it? Do you think it's a modern problem or, yeah, has it always been there? I, my, my, my guess is it's always been there and I wonder has it been there um, when our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers were having far, far, far more children. I mean, an awful lot of them must have been miserable. Mm -hmm. And if it happened after birth and got progressively worse, I think that would have led to the association that it's associated with pregnancy and given birth. I think also that um, it's still a taboo. These issues, you see, whether it's incontinence, I think, whether it's urine, fecal, sexual and mental health, a lot of them are still taboo, but they're very intimate, sensitive, private issues. And we're not good at talking about them. And it's not just us, but, you know, here in Ireland, but in many countries, we're not good at talking about those issues. And I think until we start using the language with women that it happens, here are the stats to see how common it is. It's not just you. And women say, you know, they feel embarrassed. There's just nobody's talking about it. So it's not just, so it's just me. It's not just them. Considerable proportions of women are affected. But the bottom line again is it's common. It's not normal. And it can be treated. So that leads me to my next question. So if women are experiencing these issues, what can they do now? What resources are available for them to recover? Within, it, it, it depends on what they've been doing already, I think, Carla, and it depends on where they are receiving their care. For example, um, some women will come to pregnancy and they'll have been doing yoga, pilates, gym work and stuff and be very comfortable doing pelvic floor exercises. Other women will have difficulty locating where the pelvic floor muscles are. So what can a woman do? The first thing she can do is know where her pelvic floor muscles are. 
know how to find them and how to exercise them correctly. And if she, if a woman doesn't know that, I would say to her, please ask at your next visit, whether it's with a midwife or whether it's with a nurse someplace else, or whether it's with a women's health physiotherapist. Again, I think, I don't know what proportion of women are asked or are not asked about it during pregnancy, but if they're asked about it during pregnancy, the next issue they need to ask about is, well, what can I do? And those are pelvic floor muscle exercises. Every midwife should be able to, and doctor, should be able to help a woman learn how to do them properly. And some institutions have full times and teams of women's mental or women's physio health physiotherapists who can help women develop the skills to do them properly. The other thing that a lot of maternity services will have are antenatal education components that include exercises and pelvic floor muscle exercises. So those are the first things at local level, I think, and for any woman. Postpartum, I think it's, again, what can a woman do? Recognize that it's happening and make a decision that you're not going to put up with it. If you can do the exercises yourself, fantastic. If you're confident you're doing them correctly, great. If not, see what services are available at your local services, be it maternity services or primary care services, and look for a referral for help. Again, with WAM, I think, and nowadays, and given particularly the current situation with um, restricted access and in-person access to service, the WAM videos week two, developed by my colleagues, um, Neve Kenny and Cindy Cusick. Cindy is the um, lead women's health physiotherapist in Ireland, have developed these absolutely fantastic videos. And they go through all about incontinence and pelvic floor exercises. And what incontinence is, what type of incontinence exists, um, how you know your triggers. So what's going to trigger you particularly to leak urine? How you can do something at that point when you experience your trigger to stop yourself from leaking urine. And those, and then to take you through how to do pelvic floor exercises. And Cine has developed these fantastic coached exercises they're online they're free they're on our youtube channel and they take women how to do those squeezes and do the fast squeezes and the slow squeezes the other thing caroline that women tell us is that they might know how to do them but being a mother means being very very busy mm -hmm. and the challenge for a lot of women is not just doing them but remembering how to do them yeah and we also, as part of WAM, develop these um, track your progress. So there's three downloadable leaflets. You can put them on your phone. You can edit them on your phone. And you can um, use them as a reminder. And there's a, another downloadable leaflet to things you can do to remind yourself so that pelvic floor muscle exercises, like all exercises, they become a habit. And it's when you start doing them regularly, when you start doing them often, and building them into your everyday life, they become your normal activity. Yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic resource to have, brilliant. Yeah, they are, they're gorgeous now, I would have to say. And uh, Cine and Lee were just excellent. Yeah, fantastic. So another kind of taboo around pregnancy and birth is sex. So the MAMI study had very interesting findings in relation to sex after childbirth. Can you tell me about them? Uh, my colleague Giorgio O'Malley did um, her PhD and studied the sexual health strand of MAMI. And what she found was fascinating, that um, sexual health is, and sexual health issues, they're complex. It's not just about sexual activity or the physical side of it that a lot of people might focus on initially. Mm -hmm. Sexual health issues, and particularly after motherhood, is complex. It's about relationship issues. It's about intimacy. 
it's about psychological issues, how we feel about our body, our shape. And it's not so much, much more than the physical side and actually having sex or penetrative sex. Again, like all of the other problems, I mean, we found that even before the first pregnancy, one, about one in five women experienced pain during intercourse or had difficulty at having an orgasm or something like that. And the proportions were um, very high at three months postpartum and some women were, were experiencing pain first time they have, were having sex. I think it was about 40% of women, which was quite high. But what Deirdre's results showed over time was that the number of women who were experiencing problems gradually declined. And some women had resumed sex five to six weeks after the birth when they felt right and it was right and ready for them. And others waited up to a year. So it was very, sexual health and intimacy was very individual. But there was a couple of really key points that came out of it. And one was that the women who seemed to adjust faster were those who had really that lovely, open, able to talk to your partner conversation about how they felt, mm -hmm. how they felt about motherhood, how they felt about the loss of interest in sex, how they felt about how their body had changed and they were, particularly breastfeeding women, were experiencing a lack of vaginal lubrication. Um, they also said that even if they hadn't resumed sex or after, even after 12 months, many of them experience real satisfaction with the relationship. And that really struck a chord with Georgia and it showed that it's much, much more than the sexual activity, physical side of it. It was about, for, for some couples, it was about hand-holding, cuddling, staying close, so that they were sleeping in the same bed at night, hand holding on the sofa. The yeah. real sort of intimate relationship things. And I guess partners often misunderstand um, the mother's feelings in this regard and can sometimes feel neglected or abandoned when the mum doesn't want to have sex. What would you say to partners who are listening in this situation? I think that they, they would, the one piece of advice I'd give to a partner is, even watch some of the videos so you see what some of the, what George talks about some of the women. And it's that openness, isn't it? And some couples have it, and some couples have it in varying degrees. But it's being able to open and being able to be open and say, look, this is how I feel. The women that George interviewed told her that they, you know, that they felt guilty about not being interested. Some said they prioritized sleep over sex. <laughs> But, of course, you know, three months postpartum, if you have that overwhelming exhaustion of first-time motherhood, yeah. sleep becomes important and sex will become less enjoyable, certainly, if you're sleep-deprived and you're not that interested in it. So I would say it was that, oh, that real relationship thing mm -hmm. and being able to be open, talk about it. So if anyone out there is listening to this and they're wondering where to start, or whether it's sex, whether it's leaking urine, whether it's anxiety or mental health issues, if you can't, if you yourself feel that you struggle to talk because these issues are too sensitive or you don't have the words or they're too intimate, point someone towards the videos and let them be the conversation starter. That really sums it up. So is there any other resources that are available to, to women to help them support with any of these issues besides the WAM and everything else you mentioned? Is there anything else that you can think of? The other thing, WAM, although we've, we've built all the videos of WAM now, but there, the one thing I would say to people is they've been watched now at this stage, I think from by about 8,000 women all over the world. Brilliant. I'm saying women, it's not just women, it's women it's their partners and it's also maternity care professionals who are beginning to use them as to complement their practice and to offer them to the women as a resource which is fantastic are there any other resources there's lots of different websites the one thing i would say and there are a lot of resources and some of them are brilliant um, the one thing i would say is 
know your sources to any woman who's beginning to look at them, know where their information is coming from. I mean, places like the National Health Service in England, health service in different countries will have wonderful resources. And they've been built by professionals, I think, and they are dependable. But that's what you want, something that's reliable, dependable. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, start with a health service. Start with many of our services in Ireland now, maternity services, health service executive, are developing lovely online resources. So start there. But before that internet sucks you in and down a rabbit hole, go to a professional source. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting, dear Joe. Thank you so much. So I'm so grateful to have you on the show today. Uh, I'd like uh, people to recommend, or I'd recommend people to register with the WAM course, which can be found at futurelearn.com. I'd also uh, like to thank you for your fantastic work and for furthering an, the understanding of experience of motherhood with your research, particularly with the MAMI study, which our listeners can learn more about at um, wwwtcd Um That was the lead researcher of the MAMI study, Dr. Deirdre Daly. I'll be back soon with another episode, so keep an eye on my website, dublinhomebirth.com, my Instagram, Twitter and Facebook pages at Dublin Home Birth. If you or someone you know is affected by maternal health, um, mental health or anxiety issues, you can contact your uh, healthcare professional. I've also included links to some voluntary resources that are available in the show notes and my website at dublinhomebirth.com forward slash podcast. Um, there's no need to suffer in silence. There's help and support freely available and I can't recommend this enough. You don't have to do this on your own. I've been your host and midwife, Carolyn Coughlin. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Mm -hmm.